welcome. We're glad you're here today. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to see everyone in the Lord's house today. We have a couple of announcements to go over. Senior lunch meals for the month of September will be the 11th and the 25th at 1130. The SAS Ladies Cards Ministry meetings <laughs> will be the 1st and the 15th at 3 o'clock. They will meet in the library. We'd like to congratulate Blair Gilmore on being baptized, giving her life to Christ. If you would like to send her a card, you may do so at 155 East Fair Street in Claremont. That address is in the bulletins. The Oil Belt Senior Adult Day is October 17th, beginning at 9 a.m. Pre-registration is by October 3rd online or at oilbelt.com. The fee will be $20. Van ride list. If you are needing a van ride on Sunday and Wednesday, please sign in your name on address, day, and phone number on the foyer front counter, and they will take care of you. Youth events, junior high, please register CIY Mix by September 23rd. Also, CIY, or excuse me, Strange Overnight event, October 13th and 14th at Oil Belt. Please register by September 12th. More information will be found in the foyer, or you can get up with Keaton. Third and fifth graders, starting on September 11th, we will be have a special Wednesday night class just for you. We'll be studying Proverbs. If you know someone at this age, please invite them. You don't want to miss that. The All Church Fellowship Fall Kickoff is just around the corner. It's September 22nd from 1130 right after church to 4 o'clock. We'll be having chowder and chili will be provided. Pickleball and games for all ages are planned. Invite a friend and come enjoy an afternoon of fun and fellowship as a church family. There will be an opportunity on Saturday, September 21st, to help out with the prep and the stirring of the chowder. And there's also a sign-up sheet in the foyer for ingredients for the chowder. So if you'd like to donate some please sign up, and the supplies need to be here by September 18th. On the prayer list, can you, if you can please contact the church secretary, which is Bev, if you have anyone on the prayer list that is needing revised. And lastly, we here at the church are said to announce the passing of Mildred Berlin. So let's please, please keep her family in our prayers. Thank you. I am glad you're here today um, on this Labor Day weekend. Have a stand <laughs> instead of a seat. Have a stand. And we're going to sing a, a medley of a couple of really good old hymns. So everybody smile because it talks about in a melody, Phoebe singing, you know, you'll get it. Okay. <laughs>
sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I you sit down if you promise to sing, okay, because we have another um, uh, medley. Raise your hand, though, if you knew those last two. Okay, some of you, some of you, okay, you got to learn some of these old hymns. This is, these are the good ones that will keep you singing all week long. These, we're going to go to some choruses on uh, worship and praise to our Lord.
for our communion hymn today, we're going to sing in Christ alone. And it really does have a message of from, um, well, how is our hope and our strength? But it, it's, it starts where he came to this earth and then how he gave his life for us. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness. Good morning. You know, one of the most interesting parts of doing communion is uh, trying to figure out what I'm going to do communion on. Uh, so for this week, I was at a loss, really had no idea. So I'm like, I'm going to pick a book at random. And I was trying to figure out how best to just pick a book at random in the Bible. So I literally went to my daughter and said, name a book now. She said Psalms. Before I can ask to name a chapter, she said 23. So that's my favorite. I'm like, all right, so we're going to do it on the 23rd Psalm which conveniently has been a mantra throughout my life. So the 23rd Psalm plays really personally to the careers I've chosen. I've been in the military, I've served in combat, I did EMS, and now I work at a prison. So yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art, thou art with me. Is something I have said millions of times in some really sketchy situations. But thinking about the 23rd Psalm, What's the most important part of it? I know you can't really narrow that down, but I think I have a little bit. But first, let's read through the whole thing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me through, through all the days of my life, 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So like I said, with my careers, I've always narrowed in on walking through the valley of shadow of death. And I think through is the key point there, that we use this prayer or this, this chapter to know that no matter what we're going through, we're going to make it through the valley of the shadow of death, for God is with us. When I went into combat, I wouldn't walk in without my rifle, my Kevlar, my helmet. Through life, I don't physically have those, but I have the protection of Christ because Jesus went to the cross and died for us. I know no matter what we go through in this life, we will make it through that valley. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your son's sacrifice on the cross so that we can have eternal life and know that even though we go through tough times, that we'll be able to make it through. For you are with us, you are our comforter, and you are our protection and our shield. We ask that you bless us and help us make it through this next week. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So great to see all of you folks. Hey, we're at that spot in our service where we take a moment to stand up and say hello, and we let our kids sneak out to Children's Church. So let's go ahead and do that. Fantastic. Well, we are 
in store for a beautiful day. Glad to be on the other side of those 90 degree days. I feel like I'm becoming a lightweight, but I'm not. 90 is hot here. Um, let's grab our seats and we will take some time to study the Bible. If you brought your Bible, grab it. Open it up to Mark chapter 9. That's where we're going to be in just a moment. But before we get there, I want to tell you that I really appreciate you folks. You take some time out of your weekend to come here to, to pray and worship and study the Bible together. And it's just so great to see all kinds of folks showing up. New faces every week, which is super encouraging that the Lord is uh, growing our family here at CCO. We know that the Lord wants us to get together as a church often and regularly, at least every Sunday, to worship Him and uh, encourage one another. And we know from the designs laid out for us in the New Testament that this time together is, of course, to be focused on Jesus and, and what he has done for us. But it's also a, a one another time where uh, the Lord wants us to pay attention to each other and to encourage each other. And we know that the way we interact really matters to Jesus. I mean, it really does. It's not just, oh, it's nice you get along. No, it's, it's a, a high priority for Jesus that his people uh, interact with each other well. Uh, why does the New Testament spend so much time talking to the church, churches, about getting along? All of the New Testament letters, the epistles, are are written for specific situations, and it's usually because something is going on in the church that's disrupting harmony and peace. People are bickering, so Paul will write a letter and, and send it off, write a letter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Why so much attention in the New Testament to how you and I interact with each other? I think it's because Jesus must know how hard it is for fallen human beings to behave well around each other for extended periods of time. What is the, uh, what is the adage about company at home? Uh, three days, right? Isn't that because <laughs> they start to smell like, I don't know what it is. There's, a, there's an adage about that. That whenever you get us together for very long, we have a tendency to kind of bump in to each other. And I think we get that. I mean, just look at what we human beings are capable of doing to each other. It's not always that great. I mean, on any given day, the news reports about one politician calling another politician some kind of unflattering name. I'm sick of it already. And we've got like, what, 70-something days left till the... To the next uh, election, so enough of that already. On a more serious note, we hear about a terror attack on another place on the planet or a crime that occurs down the street, and we, we know, we know that we human beings are capable of being very terrible to each other. We were not created to fight with each other. We're not designed for it. We get wounded inside. Well, I'm tough. No. We get wounded inside. Even though we weren't designed to fight with each other, we do fight with each other. And, and even in the church. And I really wish that the people of God were not plagued with this kind of, of, of problem. But we are. I mean, we Christians can be rough on each other as well. Nobody seems immune from conflict in the church. When I went to seminary, I took three courses in conflict resolution to how to help people get along in the church. I recently heard something um, that just blew me away. One of my favorite Bible teachers of all time is a guy named Chuck Swindoll. Have you ever heard of him? Okay, good. So I he, uh, he pastored a church in Southern California when I was a student over there. He then went on to be the president of Dallas Seminary, and now he's a pastor. He's in his mid-90s and, and still going strong. I started listening to Chuck Swindoll's daily radio program when I was a teenager working a landscaping job in Terre Haute, Indiana, once upon a time. And I haven't stopped listening to the guy. His 
Radio broadcast is just a lot easier to find now through uh, podcasts, Insight for Living. That's not a commercial. I don't get a kickback or anything like that. But it's a good one. Um, listening to Swindoll these days is like hearing from a loving grandfather who's just imparting wisdom. Um, and I recently heard Swindoll say that he gets, check this out, Chuck Swindoll, he gets three to four pieces of hate mail each week from angry Christians. Christians. Chuck Swindoll. Who could be mad at Chuck Swindoll? And yet he's getting hate mail every week. If he isn't immune from conflict in the church, then who is? The answer to that question, even though it's rhetorical, is nobody. We're all susceptible to conflict. And unfortunately, conflict exists in Jesus' church. I want us to talk about that today. Now, let me just put your mind at ease. There's nothing going on here at CCO that I know of. Notice I said that I know of. I, I don't know. But this is one of those prescriptive kinds of uh, discussions that we should have before bad stuff happens. Making sure that we are putting our focus where it ought to be. Unfortunately, conflict does exist in Jesus' church these days. It's not supposed to be this way. Jesus never wanted this for us. He wants us to be a loving family of brothers and sisters in Christ who get along and faithfully represent us, or him. He wants us to be at peace with one another. In fact, those are, that's a direct quote from Jesus. Jesus calls us as a family of believers to be at peace with each other. Here's our, our plan for today. I want us to look at two passages of scripture. Both of them are, are direct quotes from the mouth of Jesus, where he's going to encourage us to be at peace with each other. We're going to see why it's so important to him. And we're going to look at these short passages and quickly pull out a couple of timeless principles that need to guide us in our interactions with each other. But we're not just going to leave it in the realm of theory. We're going to get super practical. Here's some steps that we can take to ensure that we uh, are following Jesus' priority, which is our peace with each other. So let's start with Mark chapter 9. I already gave you a heads up. Uh, that that's where we're going to begin this conversation. In Mark chapter 9, I'm going to read a verse that sounds like it's coming out of the middle of nowhere. Then I'll give it a little bit of context, okay? Would you smile at me real quick? Thank you. I preach better when you do that, so it just helps. Here we go. This is Jesus speaking in Mark chapter 9, verse 50. He says this, Salt is good. But if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Have salt among yourselves. Be salty in a good way, Jesus is saying. Being influential. And the way to do that, he says, is and be at peace with one another. You see that? Last little line of Mark chapter 9, verse 50. Jesus tells us to be at peace with each other. Now let me give you a little bit of context. Why is he even having this conversation. Who's he talking to? He's talking about his disciples, his 12 closest followers. And apparently, they're upset because they saw some people casting out demons in Jesus' name, even though they weren't really Jesus' followers. This happens in verse 38 here. John, that's the Apostle John, said to him, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him. Because he wasn't following us. Don't stop him, said Jesus. Because there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name who can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. And whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, truly, I tell you, he will never lose his reward. Jesus then goes on. And with that last line tells us to be at peace with one another. He's making that statement, that command to be at peace in response to this complaint from his disciples. They were worried that people who weren't really following Jesus were doing ministry in his name. And Jesus told them, look guys, don't worry about it. There's a lot of other things to worry about. Don't worry about that. And so while setting them straight, 
about the nature of conflict, say the brewing conflict between his followers and potential followers, while setting them straight, Jesus makes a comment about our tendencies to be at odds with each other. And so that's why in Mark chapter 9, verse 50, he says, be at peace with one another. Now, what does Jesus mean by being at peace with one another? Does that mean agree with everybody? Well, how impossible is that? Does that mean just accept everybody as they are? How impossible is that? What does he mean when he says be at peace with each other? This word for peace is the common word for peace in the New Testament. There's not a whole lot of uh, help that a definition from a Greek dictionary could give us at this point. But if we look closely at the context here, we, we figure out pretty quickly what Jesus means by peace. And track with me here. I've already told you that the disciples were concerned that, that others were kind of horning in on their spiritual territory. This is our thing. These people are horning in. Jesus saw a conflict brewing between his disciples and, and whoever these other people were. Maybe he saw them as potential disciples. And so Jesus, in the, the midst of this brewing conflict, says, be at peace. Be at peace. So, what is he talking about? Well, being at peace in this context means resisting conflict. Resisting the urge to fight. Resisting the urge to go, of going from, you know, from zero to a hundred at the drop of a hat. And so I think the timeless principle, remember I told you we'd pull some timeless principles out of these passages pretty quick. I think the timeless principle here that we can get from this statement that Jesus makes is, is pretty simple. Jesus' followers should resist conflict, not seek it. Jesus' followers should resist conflict, not seek it. Now, notice that I said resist conflict and not avoid conflict. Let me help you understand the difference between uh, the two. Uh, avoiding conflict could, could mean ignoring an existing conflict. You know, just pretending that it's not there. After the fact, just saying, well, I'm not going to participate in that. Resisting conflict happens before the fact. Resisting conflict means doing everything we can to keep from being in conflict. To do everything we can to keep from bickering with one another and, and making something happen uh, from happening in the first place. An adage that my kids and I like to share with each other is, don't start none, won't be none, right? Don't start conflict, there won't be a conflict. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. He's encouraging us to resist conflict and not seek it. To do whatever we can to cut it off at the pass and keep conflict from happening in the first place. How important is our peace with one another to Jesus? Well, this is not the only place in Scripture where he shares this idea with his followers. You're in Mark chapter 9. Turn to the left in your Bible and find Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is uh, the first chapter of what we call Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. I want to show you another passage in Matthew 5. Again, straight from the mouth of Jesus where he deals with this exact same issue. Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 21. Jesus says this. He's got a crowd listening to him. Disciples, people who are curious, all different kinds of folks who are watching him, listening to him say this. And he speaks these words. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court, and whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. We read this verse. Stacy and I teach the elementary age kids, Sunday school. We read this verse in there, and the brother-sister language freaked him out. You mean I have to get along with my... 
hellfire? I said, hey, it's okay. We walked them through it just the way I'll walk through this with you right now. Understand the, the, what Jesus is saying. Hey, you think that you're getting along with each other as long as you haven't straight up murdered somebody. But I want you to know, this is Jesus speaking, I want you to know that when you're angry with someone, when you call them a name, when you let that run free, that you are guilty of sin as well. People who murder people will be judged by God, but so will people who are angry with people, who fly off the handle, who call one another names. Do you see what he's, he's saying there? He's saying, this stuff is just as bad as that thing. He goes on to continue. He says, so, verse 23, if you are offering your gift on the altar, imagine somebody being at the temple offering a sacrifice. So if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there. Leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Um, Jesus is telling his followers in the Sermon on the Mount here that their, their righteousness, their holiness, their right standing before the Lord really ought to go all the way to their hearts and not just stay on the surface level like the religious leaders of their day. He then goes on in the rest of chapter 5 to illustrate what he means. And what he means is uh, that we have to address the condition of our hearts, that, that our, who we are and what we're struggling with isn't just seen in our actions, it's also inside. And you know that as well as I do. He wants us to understand that God knows that too. God's aware and that he sees. And so he illustrates this concept throughout chapter 5 by talking about things like anger, lust and retaliation he's illustrating the fact that our righteousness must go deep and not stay on the surface the first illustration that he shares is what we just read that anger with one another conflict with one another is an issue that we need to prioritize our peace and so he imagines this scenario he imagines a scenario where, where somebody might go to worship God at the temple in Jerusalem, which is what they did back then. Right? And while they're offering uh, an offering, maybe they hear something spoken, a verse of scripture from the Old Testament is read, and they realize that somebody out there has been offended by them. They're the perpetrator. They've caused hurt. Jesus says, if you're in that situation, stop worshiping me and go fix that. That's a big deal. If you are approaching God and you realize that you have hurt someone and that wound is still open and you're aware of this and you know it, put me on hold. And go address that situation. And then, and then, come and worship me. We're not to treat each other badly, Jesus says. How important is it? He, he's fine if we have to stop worshiping him to go resolve a situation. So I was rehearsing this sermon this morning. I thought, what if like right now a bunch of people stood up and headed out the door? Like, <laughs> At least I know they're listening. No, I don't know. I don't know. The bottom line is we shouldn't harbor anger against each other or insult each other. Those are the illustrations that he uses in that passage. And if we do, if we're the kind of people that are brash, rough, Jesus says, fix that. Fix that before you come to me. Reconcile those problems. Do it now. Don't let anything else happen before you do that. And so I think the, the timeless principle, the big idea in this passage is, is uh, equally obvious. Jesus calls us to reconcile our differences immediately. 
That's how much our peace is important to him. He calls us to reconcile our differences immediately. Our peace as brothers and sisters is so important to Jesus that he says, put your worship on hold and deal with that so that we can then come to him with pure hearts and clean hands. And so we've got two timeless principles so far. That's what we've been doing this morning. And, and we'll just look at them next to each other and realize that they're kind of saying the same thing. Uh, in the first passage we saw in Mark 9, Jesus calls us to resist conflict, not to seek it. In this passage we just looked at in Matthew 5, Jesus calls us to reconcile differences immediately. If I was to cram those together for you this morning, I might say something like this. In these two passages, we've seen Jesus call us to resist and reconcile conflict. Jesus wants us to resist conflict before it ever happens, and he wants us to reconcile it if it does happen. And so then, Jesus calls us to resist and reconcile conflict. That means that if Jesus is our Lord, then this discussion is over. Like, wow, we're out early today. <laughs> Unfortunately, this discussion is not over, right? We should be living in peace and enjoying conflict-free relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But that's just not always the case. Conflict and strife have always plagued Jesus' church. Like I mentioned a moment ago, that's why we have many of the letters that we have in the New Testament. Why is conflict such an issue? This is not an insult. The truth of the matter is we are fallen. We are all corrupted by sin, and we don't think the way we should. We don't act the way we should all of the time. We are new creations because we put our faith and trust in Jesus. Amen? But we still have tendencies. We still have appetites, and our egos get bruised as we live around other fallen people. Our egos get bruised. Pride rears its ugly head. Anger flares, and we start to fight with each other. Maybe even hate each other. What's the antidote to this condition? What do we do? Well, I think we take Jesus' words seriously, but I think there are a few practical steps that I could share with you that might help us. How can we actively pursue peace? Because that's what we're talking about, pursuing peace. How can we actively pursue peace today? Let me get real practical, and let me just cut to the chase I respect you enough to understand that you're, you just want me to stop beating around the bush and get to the heart of the matter. Okay, here's to do number one. Reconcile your conflicts. Reconcile your conflicts. If Jesus is our Lord, and he is, amen? If Jesus is our Lord, we need to take his word seriously, and we need to work to restore our relationships, especially those amongst the household of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. And listen, I understand that somebody out there might be upset with you, uh, even though you didn't do anything, even though you're unaware of why they're upset with you. Listen, that happens, and there's not a whole lot we can do about those cases. But the case that Jesus is talking to us about in Matthew chapter 5 uh, is a situation where we have hurt someone. And we know that that wound is still open. Jesus tells us to fix it. To seek reconciliation now. And you might think, well, how? It's just you know, egos and then you don't understand. There's a lot of water under the bridge. I'll tell you what. We can make it complicated. And think of a thousand excuses why we should not do what Jesus tells us to do. Or. Or we can keep it really simple. Maybe it's something like this. Call them up. Send them an email. Say, hey, my annoying preacher told me I have to do this. But I heard a message this morning and God has used it. And listen, I know I've hurt you. I'm sorry. It can be that simple. It can be that simple. You can say, look, I don't want to relitigate the argument. I don't want to hash it through, but I understand that I've hurt you. I apologize. That's not how I usually am. I apologize. And if you do that, 
you got to mean it, all right? You got to mean it. Reconcile the conflict. Past experience has shown me that it's better to do it now, not later, because the longer it goes, the harder it gets to fix. Or maybe you need to start with this second to do. Maybe there's, a, there's a, uh, an earlier issue that has to be resolved first. So my second to do encouragement to you this morning is this. Recognize the conflict. If there's tension in a relationship, stop pretending there's not. Just pretending doesn't resolve anything. I know good Christian people, not here, good Christian people who go to the same church, who are really at odds with one another. They just smile and wave as they walk through their church lobby together, and they're really upset on a deep level. They feel they got cheated in business or uh, another issue of that magnitude. And so they just smile at each other. Their, Their way to deal with it is just to smile and pretend that everything's okay, even though they know it's not. And I want to tell you, there's nothing noble in acting that way. Nothing gets resolved that way. That conflict is still there. You're just pretending it's not. La, 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 like your kids, right, when you're telling them what to do. So I would encourage you to stop ignoring conflict. Recognize it. Deal with it appropriately. And then finally, this is my third. And you're looking at me right now like, this dude is meddling in our business. He's ruining our Sunday afternoon. No, no. Just, I'm your brother in the Lord. I'm just trying to encourage you here. But my third encouragement uh, to do that we all need to embrace would be this. Contain your conflicts. Contain your conflicts. We have this tendency to spread our conflicts around. So... uh, that we don't have to share them on our own. To, to spread our conflicts around uh, to, to everyone who will give us a listen, right? Uh, if someone offends us, we want everyone to know what a bad guy that guy is. And when we do this in church, the scope of the conflict that was this big spreads out and starts to include a lot of other people. That doesn't help. That doesn't help. It it just makes the situation worse. It makes it bigger. Something so small can become so big. Listen, I'm not saying don't talk to anybody if you've been hurt. I have trusted friends and mentors uh, who I talk to when I get offended. But mostly to check my own thinking. Hey, this person said this and it really upset me. Is it me? And nine times out of ten they're like, yes. Yes, it's you. Stop being so sensitive. Chill out. But other people go underground with hurt. They go underground and it begins to affect not only how they treat another person, but how other people see and treat that other person. And listen, here's what I know from the two passages we looked at this morning. Jesus does not want that for us. He does not want that for us. Jesus wants us to be at peace. And so he calls us to resist conflict, not to seek it. And he calls us to reconcile our differences quickly. And since that's the case, some of us probably have some work to do this week. Some need to reconcile conflicts, not because they want to, but because they want to honor Jesus. Some need to recognize a conflict. Stop pretending that it's no big deal. It's not affecting their lives. Others need to contain a conflict so that it doesn't spread and get bigger. All of us, every single one of us in this room, we need the Holy Spirit's help to pursue peace. Amen? We can ask him for it. Why don't we stand? We'll do that. Lord, we thank you for the time you've given us as a church family to be together, to uh, pray together, to sing together, to study your word. Lord, we've seen through the passages we've looked at this morning that you prioritize our peace with each other. 
put that same burden on our hearts. Move us to reconcile those conflicts with the people in our lives, especially those who are of the household of God. Make the people on the other side of that, of the other uh, end of that conflict, to be uh, open to that reconciliation. Spirit, we, we know we are fallen people. We have a sin condition, and that sin condition makes it tough for us to get along sometimes. But we're told that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And the new is you, Holy Spirit, who takes up residence in us and moves us to walk in obedience to the Lord. And so as we make it a priority to pursue peace, would you please give us the help and the empowerment we need to do that. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Are you okay to smile at me one more time? Okay, I'm thinking I might need to sneak out the back door or something, make a beeline for that exit. Anyway, hey, we're so glad that you were here with us this morning. One of the things we do here every Sunday at CCO is we offer an invitation. And we've been talking a lot about Jesus, the household of God. If you haven't put your faith and trust in Jesus, well, you need to do that. It's only through peace with him that we have the promise of eternal life in heaven. Amen? And so we never want... A service to be over without you understanding that the opportunity to respond positively to his invitation exists right here. We're going to sing a song. If you'd like to come forward and put your faith and trust in the Lord, I'm going to be standing right over here. I'd love to talk to you. If that's something that you want to do after service, don't leave today without getting that squared away with the Lord. Let's sing together.